All right, welcome everyone. Uh, this is today's PFF Disease Education Webinar Series. Um, my name uh, is Dave Letterer. I'm the, the Medical Advisor for the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation on um, Education and Awareness. And I'm joined by Dr. Arya Fisher uh, from the University of Colorado. Arya, are you there? You may have to unmute yourself again. Yeah, I just unmuted. Can you hear me now, Dave? Oh yeah, great. Welcome, welcome. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to hand it off to you right before I do that. Uh, I'm just going to remind everyone that this session is meant to be uh, informational only and neither Dr. Fisher nor myself are providing uh, any medical information, uh, sorry, medical advice or medical recommendations. Anything you hear today, if you have questions about it, you can reach out to our patient communication center, which is PCC at pulmonaryfibrosis.org. And of course, you should always discuss this medical information with your healthcare provider before making any changes to your medical regimen. Okay, having said that, uh, again, I want to welcome Dr. Fisher and I'll, I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, this is a real honor to be able to speak to you all. I thank you all for taking time out of your days uh, to hear this presentation. Um, I'll be speaking on autoimmune forms of interstitial lung disease. Um, also termed connective tissue disease associated interstitial lung disease. Um, I work at the University of Colorado in the Division of Rheumatology. I also have an appointment in the Division of Pulmonary uh, Medicine, although I'm a rheumatologist and my focus is primarily interstitial lung disease and lung disease as it intersects with autoimmune conditions. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, none of which I think are relevant to the content of this presentation. And um, in advance, I'll, I'll suggest that, Dave, you have expertise, of course, as a pulmonologist focusing on lung fibrosis and interstitial lung disease, and this interaction between rheumatologists and pulmonologists could be so helpful. So I'd ask that you feel free to jump in as you see fit, and I may engage you as well. Fantastic. Um, so just as to let us understand the background and maybe set the stage. So when we say as physicians, as doctors, interstitial lung disease, we often will use the term pulmonary fibrosis interchangeably. Um, sometimes that can be confusing, but basically what we're trying to convey is that this is a spectrum of types of lung injury patterns that are grouped together because they share certain properties. And basically, they may share inflammation or fibrosis within the lung tissue, what we call the lung parenchyma. And it's important to recognize that these lung patterns, these injury patterns, can come about from different exposures in the environment, such as smoking, such as asbestos, um, other exposures like feathers and silica. They also may arise because the patient has a, an autoimmune condition like rheumatoid arthritis, um, rarely with lupus, um, other diseases that we'll talk about like scleroderma or Sjogren's or muscle inflammatory diseases, and sometimes they just arise without a clear predisposing factor, a known entity. We call those patients as having an idiopathic form of interstitial lung disease, idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. So we've talked a little bit about what the background is in terms of fibrosis versus inflammation, and, and we'll use a CAT scan to get a sense as to where the disease is located and how much disease is present. So I've shown you here, um, looking straight at a patient, a coronal view, what we will see here are uh, primarily normal lungs in the upper lung zones and the fibrosis or interstitial lung disease, if you could see my pencil here, uh, in the lower lung zone. So that's where the interstitial lung disease is located. It's pretty symmetric in this patient and this is a characteristic distribution that we would expect for a patient that has an autoimmune form of lung disease. You can't tell for sure that this is an autoimmune ILD, but that lower lung zone predominance and this pattern that looks like a combination of fibrosis and inflammation is what we would typically see, for example, in a scleroderma patient. This is, this is one of my scleroderma patients. Um, the other way we look at this is we turn the patient 
We lay them on their back, and now we slice them, so to speak. This is an axial image where now we're looking with their head through the machine, their feet are kicking out at us, their back is on the table, and we've just sliced them right above the diaphragm here. We're actually seeing a liver um, on, on the left side of your screen, and then just above that is the lung fibrosis. So again, this would correlate to the lung bases being inflamed or scarred, inflammatory versus fibrosis. CAT scans may be able to give you a hint of that, but sometimes biopsies really are, um, will be able to give you more definition with regards to how much is inflamed, how much is scarred. We can see a little bit of a dilated esophagus there. So again, this is a pattern that would be lower lung zone, fibrosis, we call this interstitial lung disease, this would fit, not diagnostic of, but would fit with what we see in autoimmune patients. And I'm showing you these to try to orient the talk around the lung injury patterns and what types of, uh, what it looks like to hopefully demystify this a bit. Now if we take these two sets of images and kind of look at them on this slide, so we have on the left the coronal images right upright, we can see that the upper lung zones, the middle part, the slices one and two look pretty good. And so then if you look to the right, you can see on the axial images, the lung tissue looks pretty healthy. Uh, a little bit of peripheral disease there. But then if you look at the base of the lungs, the bases, you can see that that's where there's more lung disease. Dave, anything to add at this point from your perspective? Uh, no, that was just a fantastic description. And I would only maybe say that um, this is exactly the type of CAT scan that I also see in my practice in folks with autoimmune disease, and in particular, this CAT scan with those, those changes at the bottom of the lung, um, with those dilated airways and the, these hazy changes in the lung certainly looks very much like all of my, <laughs> many of my scleroderma patients, yeah. Thank you. And I think that when we look at these scans, it really can enrich our understanding of what the disease is doing. Um, it can help the patient understand that as well. And it may help in our um, search for cause. For example, the autoimmune patient is so predominantly lower lung zone involved that if as a rheumatologist I'm seeing a lung fibrosis patient that has predominantly upper lung zone disease, I may be less suspicious that this is autoimmune. That's not a foolproof thought per se, it's just giving us a hint with regards to um, what the underlying cause may be. When we talk about interstitial lung disease, I think it's helpful to remember that these are not disease entities in and of themselves, meaning the lung injury pattern I just showed you may occur because of a few different causes. So it's important to review the ILD, interstitial lung disease classification, I think in this helpful format, by cause. So we see cases of exposures, environment, occupations, different uh, professions, different medications that can lend to lung toxicity and lead to interstitial lung disease. We're here to talk about the autoimmune patient. So that's the scleroderma patient, the rheumatoid, the Sjogren's, the myositis patient, the lupus patient. There's a rare disease that can cause diffuse lung injury, diffuse lung disease called sarcoid. It has its own sort of imaging features. Um, idiopathic is the group of patients that's the largest group on this slide. Most of our patients actually do have idiopathic disease, uh, but it's important within that group to look at lung injury pattern and to separate those that have the pattern of usual interstitial pneumonia, which I'll show you in just a bit. But that pattern that's idiopathic is the one that's called clinically idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And we separate the other lung injury patterns that we can see, such as nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, such as respiratory bronchiolitis and others, and I'll walk you through those. But that's the idiopathic category. And then we have a group of kind of rarer miscellaneous conditions. So if we know that the patient has interstitial lung disease, we then want to move on to, to, to try to identify where they fit from a classification standpoint. Is it an exposure? Is it an autoimmune condition? Or can I say that I've excluded all of the above and in fact it is idiopathic?
The other way to say that is to do it schematically like I've done here, just visually. So here I am, a clinician taking care of a patient. That is their CT scan. So I have an actual imaging uh, picture showing me a lot of abnormal lung architecture. The lung tissue is either inflamed or scarred. And now our job as clinicians is to look carefully is this, a environment, is this environmental? Is this genetic? Is it familial? Is this perhaps an atypical infection? Is this a medication toxicity? Is it an autoimmune process? Connective tissue disease related? Is this autoimmune ILD? Or in fact, I've done all of the above, excluded all of the above, and nope, we don't have a cause. It is idiopathic. So, I've been speaking for too long already without really defining what connective tissue disease is. Sometimes it's called collagen vascular disease. So this is the group, or these are the groups of diseases that rheumatologists focus on. These are systemic autoimmune diseases. So these are diseases of our immune system. They're each different, but they have some shared properties. A lot of times patients with these conditions have autoimmune markers in their blood, autoantibodies. Sometimes they don't have those markers. Sometimes people have those antibodies, but they don't have the disease. So it's not a perfect correlation, but they often have antibodies. They often are characterized by the immune system attacking, damaging a variety of organs. Here we're talking about lung fibrosis. But I would highlight that this is a group of diseases that is very diverse. They are very heterogeneous. And that's why rheumatologists you know, spend a lot of time training around these unique entities. Rheumatoid arthritis is different than lupus. It's different from Sjogren's, the myositis family, the scleroderma family, and then mixed forms of these diseases or partial, what we call undifferentiated forms. But I would highlight that they're each unique, yet with some shared properties, and in this case, a shared predilection for interstitial lung involvement, interstitial lung disease. So I would highlight these are unique diseases, these are unique diseases and rheumatologists may get very picky about that and very particular. But yet, if I'm talking to Dr. Letterer, he may say as a pulmonologist, well, listen, you rheumatologists, you figure out what you want to call it. I can just know, and I don't mean to be at all flippant about this, Dave, I would just say you may want to know, is this a connective tissue disease related ILD or not? And maybe I'll let you jump in with your thoughts about how we group these diseases. Of course, yeah. Um, so this, of course, as you said, this comes up a lot in, in practice where I may be seeing a patient where there may be features of an autoimmune condition that we elicit when we ask questions about symptoms that you may be experiencing or when we examine you and we find certain you know, uh, changes that we see on, on the fingers or other parts of the body and then blood work might point us towards an autoimmune type of disease. Um, and then there's this, uh, this back and forth about uh, um, you know, whether or not there is an autoimmune disease, whether they're just what we call features of an autoimmune disease. Um, so very common clinical scenario um, where we're, we're, we're trying to sort these things out. Uh, and very nicely, I think, uh, on the previous slide, you, you kind of, uh, yeah, thanks, you, you grouped the, these autoimmune diseases, and there may be people on the webinar who, who carry a diagnosis of one of, one of these um, but there's also, you know, there's all this, uh, I think as you're going to talk about, uh, all the, these other patients who seem to have something related to an autoimmune condition, um, but don't fall into one of these diagnostic categories or named to diagnoses. Um, right. and but, that's, that's a helpful yeah. perspective. I mean, and part of the challenge is, is that, you know, a lot of the definitions, in fact, you know, the lungs don't really count. Right, and so if you are a lung doc and you're taking care of interstitial lung disease, you may be sort of curious as to why, if we can see ILD in Sjogren's or if we can see ILD in rheumatoid, why wouldn't that manifestation fall into a disease classification category? Um, and, and it doesn't. The only exception is scleroderma where there's enough ILD there that rheumatologists have bought in, so to speak, that the ILD count towards the criteria. But where this lends us to some challenges is that patients may have antibodies to rheumatoid, 
but not the arthritis. And then they get a lung disease that may look like a rheumatoid lung process, and that can put these two specialties sometimes at odds. And so I think it's super helpful, and I'm taking advantage of you're here uh, on the call now, but as you know, right, we got to work together to try to sort these issues out. Uh, I'll move on. And I'll move on to talk now about, I've talked a little bit about the clinical heterogeneity with regards to the autoimmune component, but we also recognize that these ILD patterns are also different and may behave differently. So when we say the patient has a connective tissue disease related ILD, we may want to know, well, which connective tissue disease are you discussing? And I think fairly, you may want to know which type of lung injury pattern. And I'm just going to run through these pretty quickly, and I've only picked three to talk about, but just to highlight that we would probably want to be more sophisticated than just saying the patient has a connective tissue disease with ILD. We actually may want to know, well, actually they have rheumatoid and their lung injury pattern is organizing pneumonia. That might help us. So let's just talk about these patterns in general. So the most um, when we talk about the ILD classification, I mentioned a few slides ago this pattern, usual interstitial pneumonia. This is an important pattern to remember, primarily because it is the only pattern that can be associated with the clinical diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. By definition, if a patient has idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, they must have this pattern. That being said, this pattern is not exclusive to the diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Remember, idiopathic means no known cause. So, I'm a rheumatologist. If I have a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, if I have a patient with scleroderma or Sjogren's, and they have this pattern, then they cannot have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Having a defined cause of ILD excludes the possibility of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This is the injury pattern, though, that we see in those patients that have IPF, but we see it most commonly in rheumatoid arthritis. So, for example, if a rheumatoid arthritis patient gets lung fibrosis, this is the most common pattern we are going to see. But we see it in scleroderma, we see it in myositis even, we see it in all of the connective tissue diseases. I have two pictures on this slide. I have a CT scan and a lung biopsy. Classically, yes, lung biopsy is the definitive way to know, but CAT scan can, a high resolution CT scan can tell us if the patient has a confident UIP, a confident pattern of lung injury, which would be characterized by imaging findings of fibrosis. We use terms like honeycombing because the lung architecture, the tissue looks like a honeycomb. Remember that this is not a disease. This is an injury pattern that can be seen in a variety of set settings. If it's of known known cause, that's idiopathic. An idiopathic disease with this pattern is the only scenario of IPF. Remember, it also can be seen in connective tissue disease. We tend to think of this one as more um, fibrotic and as such less likely to be responsive to treatment. I say that with a fair bit of trepidation, a fair bit of caution. I think we can say that most confidently in the idiopathic patient, but if the patient has an autoimmune disease, I'm not convinced that we know that they are not going to be somewhat immunoresponsive. Um, that's one pattern, UIP. This pattern, NSIP, has a hard name because it implies that we don't know what it is. It calls itself nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, but in fact it is a specific interstitial pneumonia. And what this one looks like is a little bit more cellular, a little bit more inflammatory, so to speak, than the pattern we just talked about. This is a pattern that is the most common pattern, all comers, in autoimmune patients. So if I were, as a rheumatologist, to be asked to see a lung fibrosis patient, I was told that this patient has a pattern, either on biopsy or at least strongly suggested by imaging of NSIP, my radar must go up. I have to believe that this is going to be autoimmune until proven otherwise. This is the most suspicious pattern for an autoimmune disease. And in contrast to the pattern of usual interstitial pneumonia, this one has less fibrosis 
on its imaging. It has less fibrosis on its biopsy. And what we know in general, at least for the idiopathic patient, is that this pattern tends to do better. All comers, we never can tell an individual patient how they will do, but all comers, this pattern tends to be more immunoresponsive, tends to have a better longer-term survival. In the autoimmune patient, we cannot say that with the same degree of confidence. What we can say is that there may be some differences in behavior, but we don't have the most, I guess, robust data to make those firm statements. I would say, practically speaking, more fibrosis as seen in the UIP patient may be harder to treat, may have a tougher time than less fibrosis such as in the NSIP patient. And again, reminding everyone, this is not a diagnosis. This is a lung injury pattern that can be seen across a number of entities. Medication exposure, even an infection, can suggest an appearance of NSIP. This could be a, an ex, a medication toxicity. This can certainly be an autoimmune condition. And sometimes, there's no known cause what we call idiopathic. The other pattern to highlight is a much more inflammatory, perhaps acute, and perhaps even more fulminant pattern, meaning acutely presenting, perhaps much more abrupt in the way it behaves. And that's the pattern of organizing pneumonia. Not an infectious pneumonia, per se, but a pattern of lung injury that looks very different than the ones I just showed you. This is characterized by dense areas of consolidation on a CT scan. This, as well, is not a diagnosis as much as the lung injury pattern across multiple entities. This, in contrast to the other patterns, tends to have the real possibility of complete resolution and corticosteroids, prednisone, a, a solid six-month course or, course or more, or perhaps sustained immunosuppression can really help resolve this pattern in some patients. And we see this across the spectrum of our autoimmune diseases, particularly in the myositis patient, muscle inflammatory, but we see it in rheumatoid, we see it in other entities. So I highlight that we now have sort of tried to quickly walk through this group of diseases that we somehow link as one. We say they have a connective tissue disease with ILD, but I hope I've been able to at least um, highlight and emphasize that these are unique connective tissue diseases matched or paired with unique lung injury patterns. And I only showed you three of the many injury patterns that are out there. Uh, I'm just going to pause and say, well, wait a second. Why do we really care? If we're just talking about lung injury patterns, lung inflammation, lung fibrosis, so why do you bother classifying? Why do we take such efforts to try to find cause? And specifically, why does it matter if it's autoimmune? So I would highlight three obvious things that I think we as clinicians, I think, can learn in this scenario and why it matters. Number one is treatment. If I find that this patient has an autoimmune basis for their interstitial lung disease, so number one, I can now say they don't have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and I can now take off the two antifibrotics off the list because those are restricted to patients that have IPF. If they have an autoimmune cause for their ILD, they're not going to get an antifibrotic. They're going to probably get immunosuppression. And that distinction is very important because if we treat idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis within, with immunosuppression, there's a chance we can make our patients worse. In contrast, if we use autoimmune-focused treatment, immunosuppression, in some scenarios, we can really help our patients. So the treatment may really depend on this classification. Prognostically, we never can say to an individual patient, but as groups, we know that an autoimmune form of ILD tends to do better than an idiopathic form. And so the autoimmune patient seems to have a better overall prognosis in cohorts. I think it may provide clinical context to explain what it is the patient has besides lung disease, besides interstitial lung disease. It may put mysterious symptoms or difficult other uh, problems that a patient may have into an appropriate clinical context when we now see that the patient has a systemic autoimmune disease, and it may help us look for other entities that can be associated with that, uh, known, with that known autoimmune disease. 
I mentioned that it might impact treatment. I'm just going to review for a second a very simple but I think accurate approach to how we treat these patients and why it does matter to find cause. So on the left, we have IPF, that idiopathic with UIP, which we have clinical trials. We have lung transplantation, of course. And that was the only therapy up until 2014, late 2014. We have two antifibrotics now on the market that are restricted other than within a clinical trial. They're restricted to IPF. And everybody else on the right, autoimmune patients, patients that have idiopathic um, non-UIP hypersensitivity pneumonitis, any of these patients that are progressing, we tend to use immunosuppression and a reminder that immunosuppression may be harmful in IPF. And so it, it actually matters a lot from our perspective. And I think there are other things that I've learned over the years. I may hear from patients why it matters that, you know, honestly, you know, knowing that they have a systemic autoimmune disease that explains why they developed ILD in some ways may be more um, settling uh, than saying, we have no idea why the patient got ILD. But if we link it to an autoimmune process, perhaps there's a sense of, um, there's clear understanding, a clear direction on treatment, maybe a sense of, well, you know, the scleroderma foundation, the rheumatoid arthritis organization, there may be networks that can link up. Now, of course, we have the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation for all of our patients with lung fibrosis. Um, physicians may say, well, I'll tell you what, if it's autoimmune, I feel like I have some options. I got prednisone. I have other chemotherapy options. Patients may be more responsive. And if it's idiopathic, boy, I'm sort of stuck. Now we have two antifibrotics. Maybe the pendulum is swinging a little bit back. Dave, is this, does this resonate with you, or do you have other thoughts on sort of why it matters from your perspective? Uh, no, everything you said uh, resonates with me. This is uh, exactly what uh, the way I think about things, and and uh, you know the the idea that we need a diagnosis so that we know how to treat is really important. There are some diseases that are treated one way, and others a different way. Um, so, yep, I'm I'm on board. I agree. The reason that autoimmune is a topic for a PFF webinar is because it's a real problem. And I'm going to show you just one data set out of France just to emphasize that if you were to look at an interstitial lung disease program, about a third of it, about a third of it tends to be autoimmune. Here is the connective tissue disease slice comprising about 22%. This group of patients, interstitial pneumonia, that have an autoimmune flavor that Dave referenced, Dr. Letterer referenced this earlier, patients that look autoimmune but may, may not be called a defined connective tissue disease makes up about 7%. So about a third of all of an ILD program tends to be autoimmune. And then if you looked at my clinic and say, well, wait a second, so what, which of the autoimmune diseases stand out? So scleroderma stands out rheumatoid stands out. A lot of these patients have a muscle inflammatory spectrum of disease, a little bit of Sjogren's, a tiny amount of lupus, really. Lupus you know, causes lots of lung problems, but not as much chronic uh, interstitial lung disease, per se. And then a fair bit of patients that really look autoimmune, but may not have a defined connective tissue disease. And so quickly walking through what I would call the big three, it tends to be scleroderma, rheumatoid, myositis. And so when we see a scleroderma patient like this one, you know, we know that most scleroderma patients have interstitial lung disease, and the key is identifying those that have progressive interstitial lung disease. Some of these patients have quiet, so to speak, stable ILD for years, but recognizing that this is a game changer. This is the leading scleroderma-related cause of death in scleroderma patients. So if you are a patient with scleroderma and your docs aren't talking about your lungs, right, this is just a reminder that we see lots of lung disease in scleroderma. And I see a lot of scleroderma. And candidly, we're lung-obsessed lung and lung-focused because we know what kind of clinical implications it has. We know most of these patients have NSIP. About three quarters have NSIP, non-specific interstitial pneumonia. They can get usual interstitial pneumonia. Another type of patient to highlight is that myositis patient, that muscle inflammatory disease. 
And what's tough here is that a lot of these patients with quote unquote muscle inflammatory disease that we call myositis may actually have primarily lung disease and not much muscle disease or not have any muscle disease. But we know that these are syndromes and we don't always have to have all of the features to be part of that syndrome. This too is a game changer in the sense that lung fibrosis, interstitial lung disease, is the leading cause of mortality in patients who have myositis. And so again, patients with myositis, we need to not just think about their muscles or their rashes that we can see. We need to be looking and thinking about their lungs. There's an entity called antisynthetase syndrome, which is a known entity with specific antibodies, specific lung injury patterns, may or may not have a lot of muscle involvement. Rheumatoid arthritis, I meet rheumatoid arthritis patients who have lung fibrosis and they tell me, I was never told that rheumatoid can attack their lungs. Rheumatoid arthritis needs a new name. It needs a marketing campaign. It's not an arthritis. It is an autoimmune disease that likes the joints, but unfortunately it likes other organs too. It likes the eyes. It likes the lungs. And so rheumatoid arthritis is a rheumatoid autoimmune disease that has systemic potential, and yes, it loves the joints, but it also loves the lungs. And so when we take care of rheumatoid arthritis patients, we need to be asking about their lungs, listening to their lungs, and thinking about other organs besides joint involvement. Rheumatoid has a different, um, an interesting side to it that it has a higher likelihood of having that pattern of usual interstitial pneumonia, UIP, than the other autoimmune diseases. It has more fibrosis. And this too is a meaningful contributor to mortality and morbidity, meaning the finding of lung fibrosis in rheumatoid matters. It really can impact our patients. Um, and it also, however, can be found stable, mild, doing nothing, but we'd like to know about it. So having an awareness that this is a possibility I think is really important. And I would say just to highlight that, you know, there aren't all that many rules with how these things will occur. So for example, it's very likely that a patient has an underlying autoimmune disease like rheumatoid, like scleroderma, and then develops interstitial lung disease. And at any point in their course, it's also possible that actually we don't know that the patient has rheumatoid. We didn't know they had scleroderma. They show up to a lung doctor. They're found to have interstitial lung disease. Assessments with blood tests, looking at hands, asking about joints, maybe a lung biopsy, maybe something about the CT scan or scenario ticks off the doc to say, you know what? Yes, they have interstitial lung disease, but I'll tell you what, that is the first manifestation of rheumatoid, or that's the first feature of scleroderma, and that's where we have to work as a team to try to help make that determination. And yet, there are other patients, I think, that still can be very confusing because they may have interstitial lung disease and they may have a marker in their blood, an antibody. They may have a biopsy feature or there may be something about their history that looks autoimmune, but perhaps your autoimmune expert, so to speak, your rheumatologist, may not be as convinced that they have a label, that this is rheumatoid, that this is scleroderma. And we can call those patients by different names. I think we're leaning more and more these days to just describe what they have and not, so to speak, pretend that we know the end result. But just say that what, the, what, what we're talking about. We're talking about patients that have interstitial lung disease. And yes, in fact, there are some autoimmune features but they're probably somewhere in this continuum, somewhere between a defined, I know as a rheumatologist they have rheumatoid, I know as a rheumatologist they have lupus or scleroderma, versus really that I have no idea, they really don't have features of autoimmunity, they're truly idiopathic. So this entity that we're studying more so, I think these days and coming around with uniform terminology of interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features, you know, may, uh, we have to learn a lot more about them to better understand, A, the importance of such a distinction, and B, how should we approach their treatment. I would just say the following. If I wanted to know, well, what's going to be helpful? So, 
you just said you may have a patient who has interstitial lung disease and you didn't know that they had an autoimmune disease, but there's something about their assessment that lends to the suspicion that it was autoimmune. So what is it? And I would say it's different for every patient. It may be demographics, for example. We know that IPF is a disease of older men in general, older than 60, 65, for example. So if I see a 35-year-old individual, particularly a 35-year-old woman who may be at much higher risk of autoimmune disease, we see more women with autoimmune diseases than we see men, we may look at that as an important clue. We may say different clinical features, for example, Raynaud's phenomenon, the hands that turn white, blue with cold exposure, or different rashes on the hands, or perhaps musculoskeletal symptoms like swollen, stiff joints. That may lend a pulmonologist, a primary care doctor to say, let's get a rheumatologist engaged because this may be in fact autoimmune, or different blood tests, or different CT or biopsy features. But I would say more than anything, we have to work together. I recognize pulmonologists are going to bring expertise, thoracic radiologists, pathologists are going to bring expertise, and I would argue that rheumatologists will also bring expertise to assessing for autoimmune disease. Antibodies, blood tests, if that's the only thing that's going to be done, I will tell you as patients and I'll tell my colleagues as clinicians and providers that a lot of times the rheumatology blood tests are great for generating questions and not always as great for generating answers. So going back to slide, more than anything, multidisciplinary engagement, different specialists interacting around the same patient, around the same scenario, bringing respective areas of expertise and then all of our blood tests in rheumatology need a clinical context in and of themselves not giving you answers. We in ILD circles talk about this multidisciplinary team. It really is the standard of care. We know that patients who have ILD represent a complex scenario. We really want a clinician or several clinicians. We want a thoracic radiologist. We want a lung pathologist. And ideally, knowing that about a third of ILD programs is autoimmune, we like to engage rheumatology when, when available and certainly when there's any suspicion for a rheumatologic entity. This is a little bit of a complex slide, and I don't want to get lost in the details other than to say that the first bar, that first pillar, is a classification of patients that are derived from a multidisciplinary team that did not engage rheumatology. And then the second pillar, the second column, is a group, that same group, after engaging rheumatology. And all I want to highlight is that the disease classifications often change. There's, a, a, there's an appreciation that if you engage rheumatology in, in cases Yes, you may have some changes to how patients are classified. You may go from a scenario that was considered idiopathic to actually know this looks autoimmune. And I'm not saying this is the definitive study. I'm not saying that this is the case for all scenarios. I'm just highlighting that to me this seems logical. If you're going to engage autoimmune specialists, yes, there may be some fine tuning to your classification or some modifications. Um, I'm a biased speaker, right? I'm a rheumatologist. I'm focused on interstitial lung disease. I would say if we're going to talk about autoimmune interstitial lung disease, let's get rheumatologic expertise involved as well. And then I'm going to circle back to, I think, a confusing reality. And that is that all of our diagnoses and classifications really require this integration of clinical and imaging and when available, lung biopsy data. And I'm going to show you three cases that highlight that. These are all the same lung injury pattern with three different clinical diagnoses. So this is a pattern that looks like usual interstitial pneumonia. This is the UIP pattern. So if I showed you this pattern, all three patients, same lung injury pattern, but they have three different diseases. The first box, this patient we call rheumatoid, rheumatoid lung, rheumatoid lung fibrosis. 
Why do we call it that? Because the patient has well-characterized rheumatoid arthritis and the lung injury pattern of rheumatoid. This second patient has the same lung injury pattern, but has very significant exposures to birds and feathers that we know can cause lung injury patterns as well, and their biopsy supports that. So this patient's biopsy and their exposure and their ultimate clinical scenario go from what, you know, in the patient before we called rheumatoid, now we call it hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And that last group, same lung injury pattern, but no autoimmune disease and no exposures and a confident UIP pattern. And this could be troubling to you all, and candidly it should be. It's troubling to me as a physician. And you might say, and I might say, that we have it all wrong, that we should be treating lung injury patterns and not clinical scenarios. I don't know what to tell you. I'm only going to tell you where we are clinically and where we are today. Dave, I don't know. This is an area of controversy. Um, I don't mean to throw you under the bus here. I'm just kind of understanding, do you see this same dilemma? Um, do you look at this differently? Are there other thoughts you might have just about this reality? Uh, I agree it's the reality. Uh, and I honestly, <laughs> I don't have much to add. I agree with exactly what you're saying uh, in every respect. I, I can't think of a thing to add. I'm just keeping the green light open for you, Dave. I'm not trying to hurt you here. Thank you. Um, the, the challenge, though, goes back to this slide, right? And that is, if we were to remember, of those three scenarios, only one of these patients, the group on the right, is going to be able to get treated in this day and age with antifibrotic therapy. And I have no idea whether antifibrotic therapy makes any sense for the other two patients. What we do know is that the antifibrotic therapies are restricted to IPF. We also know that immunosuppression may help those first two scenarios. We don't know that definitively, but we have a sense that immunosuppression may harm. So I would say that this is still lots of unanswered questions, um, lots of studies that need to be done to help guide us. The last part of this talk was a second, you know, just to highlight um, what it is that we have to do as physicians, clinicians, there's so much that we have to try to get from our patients. We need to learn and hear about from you all what your symptoms are. We've got to do an exam. We may look at specific autoimmune aspects. We're going to look at lung function and we've talked about the CAT scan. We may find scenarios where bronchoscopy or biopsy are helpful. And we'll make a lot of these decisions based on an individualized patient can't really make hard and fast rules about this as much as there's a lot that we have to integrate. One point very worthwhile, I think, is just to emphasize how important the HRCT scan is, the high-resolution CAT scan, to tell us so much about the type of lung injury pattern and maybe more importantly, how much of the lung is involved, the disease extent, and maybe some clues with regards to other compartments like the airways or the vasculature. And then once we've identified this scenario, remember that not every patient needs to be treated. There's a lot of lung disease in autoimmune patients that is stable, mild, not progressive, been there for years. And so we really want to make sure that we're assessing shortness of breath, assessing objectively lung function, and restricting treatment to those that are impaired and progressing. And we want to know how they may be progressing, how fast, what type of lung injury pattern. Maybe it's a rheumatoid patient whose rheumatoid arthritis is really bad, and their lung fibrosis is not doing much at all. I may need to treat their arthritis aggressively and just watch their lungs. It may be a muscle inflammatory disease. The muscles are really progressing. The lungs are quiet. And in some scenarios, like fibrosis, we may be talking about can we stabilize? Can we stabilize disease? And in other scenarios, like organizing pneumonia, can we resolve? Can we really cure? Can we really make a big difference? 
We do talk about immunosuppression. We do talk about medications that target the immune system, but we must also talk about the other stuff that may be a lot harder for patients to do, maybe harder because of the time commitment, the effort, not as easy as taking a pill, but perhaps as effective. Pulmonary rehabilitation, using oxygen, making sure that the overall patient's being cared for, their mental health, they're getting immunized. Reflux disease and aspiration can also perhaps injure the lungs or lead to respiratory symptoms like cough. So let's make sure we're addressing those things and getting out of this cycle of inactivity that may occur because it's harder to exercise or there's so many other aspects like musculoskeletal impairments that impact the ability to exercise. So we just want to emphasize these aspects, not just drug therapy. And our general approach is actually, unfortunately, quite simple. We use two primary modalities when it comes to the pharmacologic immunosuppressive strategy. We use prednisone or its cousins that we call corticosteroids. Lots of side effects, particularly at higher doses. Never a great long-term option in higher doses. Sometimes we can get away with long-term therapy at lower doses. But then we really know that we're going to need something else to allow us to control the disease, keep the immune system perhaps somewhat suppressed, but safely so, with fewer side effects than prednisone, and for a longer-term therapy. And that's where we use a group of steroid or prednisone-sparing agents. And the choice of which one is individualized. Providers have different preferences. Patients have different preferences. There are no good head-to-head -to, -head to be able to tell you which is the right one for you. But in general, our list is relatively short. And this is the list that we tend to draw from. Other centers may have a different list. Uh, but it's not a ranking list. We don't know the right one. We don't have great data to guide us. We have some data from scleroderma, but in general, we want corticosteroids and a steroid sparing agent to allow us to spare the patient all the corticosteroids. We'll, we'll borrow from scleroderma, but I would just caution, we have no data outside of scleroderma to really make firm evidence-based recommendations about which drug for what lung injury pattern for what connective tissue disease. And what we know about scleroderma, three quick slides, the next three slides, all that these numbers are going to tell us or these slides are going to tell us is that cyclophosphamide, also called cytoxan, is associated with a little bit of improvement in lung function compared to placebo. Cyclophosphamide is associated with a little bit of improvement in CT scan, a little bit of improvement in quality of life, and that is for patients who have scleroderma interstitial lung disease. That's what the scleroderma lung study showed us. The scleroderma lung study showed us that scleroderma patients who get treated with cyclophosphamide for only one year will fall right back to where they were at two years. And so what we know is that one year of immunosuppressive treatment with cyclophosphamide, cytoxan, in interstitial lung disease of scleroderma cannot just be a one-year treatment approach because if it's one year of cyclophosphamide and then we do nothing, the patient goes right back to where they were by two years. And if you wanted to do any head-to-head, -head, we would say let's compare mycophenolate, also called CELSEP, to cyclophosphamide, also called cytoxan, and that's the scleroderma lung study too. And what can you say about that comparison? Both drugs were modestly effective, meaning a little bit of improvement in lung function, a little bit of improvement in the CAT scan, a little improvement in symptoms of quality of life, a little bit of improvement in scleroderma skin thickening. Do these drugs reverse the disease? Do they, are they game changers? Unfortunately, they are not. But what are they? They are associated with disease stabilization, slight improvement, mycophenolate, a better long-term option than cyclophosphamide, fewer side effects in general mycophenolate. You might ask, well, what about rituximab? What about cyclosporin? What about azathioprine? I would say we don't have data. We don't know. We need to study that. We try it. 
but these are not as proven, so to speak, compared to these two drugs. And these two drugs are only really proven in small studies with scleroderma patients. So, for rheumatoid arthritis, we don't know. For Sjogren's, we don't know. For myositis, we don't know. I'll tell you what else we don't know, and that's not to discourage the audience. It's just to be candid with regards to lots of unanswered questions. We know that autoimmune patients with ILD can be immunoresponsive, but we don't really know if we should tailor the treatment differently by lung injury pattern. Should we treat that patient who has a more fibrotic pattern one way and a more, so to speak, cellular pattern another way? We also don't know if we should treat the connective tissue disease more directly. For example, if they all have that pattern of NSIP, should I treat rheumatoid differently than I treat lupus? Different than I treat a Sjogren's, right? If I'm going to treat that patient with CTD, connective tissue disease ILD, but I'm now going to not worry about the lung injury pattern. I'm going to focus it more if they have rheumatoid, I do X. If they have scleroderma, I do Y. Or I may say, nope, if they have a pattern of UIP, I do X. And if they have a pattern of NSIP, I do Y. I will tell you different providers have different patterns of how they may do things, but we really don't yet know. Um, and a really, uh, I think, um, poignant example is what we know about rheumatoid. 1% of the adult population has rheumatoid. It's such a common autoimmune disease. This is what keeps rheumatologists busy. And this is a list, and it's growing, of all the drugs that have been approved by the FDA that we know impact favorably on the arthritis. We call them disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Pretty extensive list, and yet we have nothing that's been proven for the lung disease of rheumatoid. Just a reminder of you know, the future endeavors that need to be undertaken. Whenever we're going to talk about treatment, it must be comprehensive, meaning we are not just taking care of a lung fibrosis problem, an interstitial lung disease problem. We're really talking about the whole patient, how their symptoms are how their lung function is doing, what other comorbidities have come about, how is their arthritis, whether there is associated depression, sleep disorder, esophageal, what can we do to prevent more trouble, bone health, vaccines, mental health, um, prevention of infection with pneumocystis prophylaxis, and maybe we have novel therapies and clinical trials to offer. And then, as we follow our patients, this long list of things needs to be considered. Really, if not at every visit, every few visits, this needs to be circled back. How are my patient's symptoms? What's happening with their exam? Their ILD, their lung fibrosis is great, but what's their muscle disease? What's their skin disease? What's their circulatory disease? How is their esophagus? How is their arthritis? What's their lung function doing? How does their CAT scan look? Have they developed other complications like heart disease or pulmonary vascular disease? So there's a lot that we're going to want to follow in our patients. And if we were to restrict it to interstitial lung disease, if you're a lung, um, if you're a pulmonologist and you're really only going to want to know how their ILD is, you still have a lot to go through because you still need to assess their symptoms, their medication tolerance, what is their lung function doing. We'll draw their longitudinal lung function data on charts such as these. What is their oxygenation? What is their CT looking like? So there's lots and lots that we will need to assess, and we do so. So we choose therapy X. We choose therapy Y. We revisit that choice in three months. We revisit that choice in six months. Are modifications needed? Is this the right approach? Am I making the progress I was hoping for? This is completely theoretical. This is me on a chalkboard saying, well, wait a second. We have antifibrotics. Can't we extend them to other patient populations? The answer is, only with clinical trial data to tell us that we're heading in the right direction. 
we've learned the hard way that sometimes if we think we're helping our patients and we study what we think is helpful may actually be harmful, we want to not fall into that same trap here. Antifibrotics are approved for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. They're being studied in other conditions. We eagerly await those results. But for now, they are not available outside of a clinical trial. And I have no idea if those antifibrotics have a role outside of IPF, but I'm eager to learn. And so I kind of wonder, will we get to a place where not only are we using immunosuppression, but maybe we'll have some patients that also have the opportunity, again, when hopefully informed by clinical trial results, to benefit not just from immunosuppression, but from antifibrotics. I'm going to finalize just or summarize just on the following eight points. Number one is this is a complex landscape, and I'm hopefully leaving you all with an understanding that this is a very complex spectrum of diseases, combined connective tissue diseases, and then a variety of ILD patterns. I'm arguing that rheumatologists need to be more engaged in this arena, classification, diagnosis, maybe help with treatment. And then I've hopefully highlighted why identifying autoimmune disease is important. Patients with interstitial lung disease require a thorough evaluation. And number five is that the CAT scan can really help us in understanding disease extent, whether um, the patient has autoimmune features on a CT scan, type of lung injury pattern, and maybe longitudinally can be helpful. And then when we're talking about treatment, we're really restricting treatment to those patients that are progressing, that have significant disease, pace, progression, pattern may impact choice. And then unfortunately, other than me saying we use immunosuppression, it's not yet as evidence-based as we'd like. For scleroderma, we can say mycophenolate, cyclophosphamide, modest effects, we need better therapies for the other connective tissue diseases, and for any of the other immunosuppressive drugs, we may try them, but we need to be candid that we don't have the best data to back up a specific cocktail, specific regimen, and we want to reassess those decisions as we take care of our patients. And I wonder whether the future does hold the hope for maybe additional therapies such as antifibrotics. Dave, I didn't involve you as much as I would have liked. I'm oh, that's okay. To... I was listening intently, and I thought that was fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, really, really great. And I hope uh, you did this for us, I think it was four years ago, and, and hopefully we can have you back even before another four years are up. Um, I do want to say a few things. One is uh, I know some of you have questions. Uh, we don't have time for questions today, but I'm going to ask each of you um, to email us. Our email is P, as in Peter, PCC, that stands for Patient Communication Center, PCC at pulmonaryfibrosis.org. Uh, and we'll do our best, uh, Lindsay and I will do our best to, to answer your questions. Uh, I also want to thank uh, our sponsors, uh, Beringer Ingelheim and Genentech, who helped support our disease education webinar series. Um, and finally, I, I want to let everyone know, and some of you may know this, um, that the PFF currently has uh, an oxygen survey that we're administering. Uh, we would encourage you to please um, fill out the survey. Uh, you can either write down this website or you can visit our website, pulmonaryfibrosis.org, or reach out to us through our oxygen information line, which is posted on the screen, 844-825-5733. Um, to find out how to fill out the survey. Uh, we've had hundreds of responses, and we're looking for hundreds and hundreds more. So thank you, everyone. I hope everyone has a, a safe and happy holiday season, and you'll hear more about our upcoming webinar in the coming weeks. Thank you, Dr. Fisher, and thank you, everyone, for participating. Oh, and I'd also like to thank Lori, uh, who organizes all of this, and Lori is leaving the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation for Greener Pastures in just a few weeks. So, Lori, thank you so much for everything that you've done for the PFF. And the